Hi, my name's Jeff Jones, director of the Big Blue Band in Mesquite, Texas. A while back, I had a completely original, somewhat borrowed idea to pick up band directors and drive them around in my wife's 2011 Honda Odyssey minivan and have a conversation. This is Maestros and Minivans. Today our guest is Professor Jerry Junkin. Professor Junkin has been the conductor of the UT Wind Ensemble for the past 25 years and also serves as the artistic director and conductor of the Dallas Winds. All right, well we're right over here. Okay, great. And I really appreciate you making time to come and be with us today. It's gonna to be- No, I'm happy to do it. It's gonna be great, gonna be. Did, did, did you wanna drive? It's actually, it's actually on. The oh, I just assumed this was be your car. Yeah, no, no, public school is different. It's a little oh, different. Oh, okay. It's nice, but you know. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I, I Up in North Texas, you know, with Eugene Corporan nearby, I just yeah. figured everybody had a car like well, that. Well, so. we were going to do Maestros and Maseratis, but it just didn't. It ah, didn't okay. Uh, we're eventually going to take a little tour of the city here. Excellent. It's called Dallas Construction. I know you're familiar. I am. There are parts of Dallas I seem to know better than the parts of town where I live, but. Now, do you maintain residences in both towns? Because I see you basically here as much as there. I know, Is it's that... a little nuts. I probably should. That would have been a good investment a few years ago, but had I known that I wasn't going to get fired by the Dallas Wind Symphony imminently, <laughs> you know, after beginning, that I probably, we probably should have done something like that, but. How many seasons did that take before you really felt secure in your... Uh, okay, so this is number 23. <laughs> so, so now you're yeah. feeling good. Okay, good. <laughs> right. I think, I think we're over the hump here. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you end up as one of the premier wind band conductors in the world, really? And, and what was the process? Like, where did you start? Did you know from day one that you were going to be? <laughs> I was fine with you until you used that word premier. That was the part that threw me a little bit. Oh, okay. So, you know, and I will tell you... It, Honestly, and I say this all the time, but I mean it, it's, there's a fantastic amount of luck that's involved in almost, you know, every, every turn in my life. Now, you've got to be in the right place at the right time, but I was in the right place at the right time for a lot of things to happen. One of them included being born. Good, good. <laughs> Very early age, I'm assuming. Yes, but, you know, I to do this, what I'm doing, you know, my life's work, I was born, my father's obviously as a band director and a, a very fine musician, which I, I didn't really realize the impact of that until later on, I think. But so I grew up going to TMEA, TBA, all that sort of stuff, you know, while I was still in the womb and going to band concerts. And uh, to me, nothing could have been more fun as a kid than going to band concerts and hanging out with all the adults and all the band directors afterwards and going out to, you know, to dinner afterwards and all that sort of stuff. I, I grew up in the band hall and I just thought it was great fun. So that's that was the seed of it, I suppose. And I won't draw it out too long because there's a lot of stuff along the way. But then, uh, you know, I was in obviously in high school band and loved it and went to UT to get an undergraduate degree in music. <laughs> never thinking that I would be back there teaching one day. And actually, probably at the time, I don't know that UT was actually my first choice of schools to go to, but there were logistical things and family reasons. And it was also, a, a, you know, a legacy issue a little bit. My father had gone to UT. My grandparents had gone to UT. My great grandmother was in the first graduating class from UT and had worked at the architecture library for many years. So um, at any rate, it was just sort of a logical thing to do. And uh, I had been on that campus and enjoyed it very much. So, but once I was there, I was really hooked. I really loved it. And the person who was the conductor of the wind ensemble, actually my predecessor at UT was Tom Lee. And he had only been there for one year when I went there. And I had a great time with him. And he really, you know, challenged me in a lot of interesting musical ways. And, um, so I had great experience there, but I love the whole thing. I love the marching band. I was in Vincent Danino's last marching band there before he retired as the Longhorn Band Director. So I just had lots of great opportunities. And then I went in, graduated, went in immediately to get a master's degree, 
the thing that I tell everybody not to do. I didn't teach first, you know, but I, but I had an opportunity. I was in the right place at the right time, and I was offered a position to, to be a teaching assistant in both clarinet and in with the band program. We didn't have the number of teaching assistants back in those days that places do now. So I thought I should do it, and I wanted to study conducting with Tom. I was beginning to get the itch a little bit. So I did that for a year, and then I was going to go fulfill my dream, which was to be the world's greatest high school marching band director. Sure. Which is what I... What else would people dream about? That's really? exactly right, and that's okay. still what I wanted to do. And I actually, I've always, I felt bad about this a little bit, but I actually accepted a job uh, in the Houston area, verbally, um, and was offered a job there. It was going to be a great job, and I was looking forward to it. I come back to Austin, and in the very next day, I was offered the job. What was my first job was to stay at UT and be the assistant marching band director because there was a position that hadn't been filled. And at the time, there was a move on campus. There was a new president. And so the word on the street was if you had unfilled positions, they were going to come in and swoop them up and take them away and redistribute them. They didn't want to lose the position. So I was sort of standing around, and somebody said, bah, hire him, you know. So he sort of did it last year as a teaching assistant. And so I thought this was a one-year job, and I thought, okay, I'll do it. I'll never in my life have the chance to teach at a college again, so I'll do it, and then I'll go be the world's greatest high school marching band director. So I, I was fortunate enough to do that, and by now my itch was into a full-blown rash and I needed to scratch it really badly so I was I really had the you know I was I had the bug and then that one year position moved into a second year and the second year moved into a third year and I had gone I did I had gone to the CBDNA conducting workshop which literally changed my life which was at that time held in Greeley Colorado where the director of bands at that time was Eugene Corporon and the clinician they had brought in was Robert Reynolds, who I had worked with before. I had met him in a couple of other situations. And so I got accepted, long story short, to come to Michigan to work on a doctorate. My nice wife agrees to quit her good job, you know, and move up there without a job. And she was going to get a job. And about a week before school started, I get a call to come see Bob in his office. And I did, and assuming that I was going to be given my first sort of task to accomplish as a teaching assistant, and he tells me at that time that, you know, we've had a change in the way things, as you know, Carl St. Clair is moving from the band area into the orchestra area, and we thought we had his workload covered in another way. So would there be any way you would consider putting off working on your doctorate and be on the faculty instead? So again, I look back at that all the time, and I think, what, what if I would have gone there the year before, which might have been a possibility? Or what if I would have stayed at UT one more year, which was also a possibility, or two years or three years, and then gone later? None of this stuff would have ever happened. Right. You know, it's just dumb luck, being in the right place at the right time. So anyway, I did that. They were great to me at Michigan. The second year, I was... Uh, I started working on the doctorate, but they made an interesting kind of appointment for me. So I was like 49% and I was on the, so I could, because if you were 50% or higher, you couldn't pursue the degree. You couldn't take any classes. So during the summer and then during the year, I was able to take classes that also gave us benefits, which was spectacular because our daughter was born that second year. And then that second year was really especially remarkable because of a lot of the stuff that was going on there. There's this premiere of this Stockhausen opera uh, that the Michigan band was involved with and ended up being, a, there was a European tour and performances in Milan uh, during the summer. It was, it was just an incredible sort of scenario, rather unbelievable that Mr. Reynolds was able to put all of this stuff together and it was able to work out. And then I get home from that and I've got a call from the University of South Florida about coming there. They had a search going on. They had called me before the tour and I said, no, I'm firmly committed to this. You know, I need to see this through. If the job is still open, well, then I could talk to you in June or July. But I came back not anticipating. Surely they would have filled this position by that time. Well, they hadn't. 
So to make a long story short, then that gave me the opportunity to go to South Florida. I was there for four years, and then the opportunity came up to go to return to UT. Had I not come back to UT, which I considered not doing at the time, because I thought, in a way, that's not the way it usually works. You know, right. you don't get to really pick and choose. Even though I loved UT, you don't really get to do that. And so a lot of times your career takes you other places. But had I not done that, I'm sure that at the time, the Dallas Wind Symphony opportunity might not have evolved the way it did. <sighs> so it's just, a, once again, you know, being in the right place at the right time. If I hadn't been the conductor of the Dallas Wind Symphony, then I probably wouldn't have been contacted by the nice people in Hong Kong about coming there. And, then, you know, everything sort of leads to the next thing. So, and you can't plan all this stuff out. I learned that because I used to try to plan. I had my career planned out. Not <laughs> one thing about that plan has worked out. Well, because as successful <laughs> as you've been, it sounds like, no offense, you, you know, you're not going very far on this best Texas high school marching band director. Thing. I know it. I, I, my career's been a failure because I never did that. Well, you know? <laughs> so, but you're still young, so I mean, that is an option. I'm not as young as as I look. Well, that <laughs> makes one of That's us scary. for sure. You know? <laughs> you ever try conducting traffic? Does that ever? No, never done that. No. Yeah. No. Not that I couldn't. Oh no! Yes, sir. I'm sure. And it would. It would be very dramatic, but I don't think. Well, I, that's, yes, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm looking but I've for. never done that. Have you? Uh, I I try a little something, but I'd be embarrassed to right. get in front of you. I just, no, I can't. I can't. Where? Yeah, yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. The Coca-Cola company was actually a great job for me in the summer, so that was fun. How did and you get involved with those guys? I, you know, I can't remember. I think I knew someone who had had that job previously, and so I just ended up applying there. And to be perfectly honest, I kind of liked the product when I was in high school. So the Coke itself, is, are you still on the, the am, original Coke I or just Bill wanna, Cosby's new Coke? No, I just want to be sure that we're talking about the soft drink. Yes. Um, that's fit. With musicians, that's probably right. a good idea to be Just very because. clear there. So it was it was a job driving a forklift in the warehouse and occasionally uh, helping out with the delivery truck guys, who all of whom were, those were some special people right there. And we had a great time. I learned a lot there working with those guys. Do you still have a forklift license? Is no, that I don't think I ever had a license, actually. As a matter of fact, I'm, given some of the damage I cause I'm not sure that I would have ever received one but kidding aside you mentioned learning you know a lot from that right and probably from the yard business too what did you what did you glean there that you could apply well I'll tell you there was this one guy they're all characters of course but there was one guy named Fuzzy who drove a coke truck who sold twice as much coke as any of the other guys okay you know and there was no question when you went out with him why he did that very personable guy so everybody liked him on his route but also he would visit twice as many places during a day he could cover more territory than like two of the other drivers combined so there was no reason why he sold more coca-cola products and why he also was more successful than the other guys got paid more all that sort of stuff it was hard work so it's funny how that seems to work it's interesting in that way right he would, he, would, he would take his truck out first in the morning, and his was always the last one to come in. Now, some of the guys who I worked with would always say, oh, gosh, I've got to be with Fuzzy today. Oh, man. And so they were, you know, they were like, this is going to be hard work. It's going to be long hours. But you were, for our position, we were being paid by the hour. So the money was better if you went with Fuzzy. So it was, you know, just an interesting sort of thing to observe mm. the entire human interaction there. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Like exactly. Kind of right. So, what was your first ride? Uh, oh my gosh. And my, how does it compare to this? You know, I, I will tell you, nothing really compares to this. Thank you. But my very first car was, uh, gosh, what was the year? I believe it was a 1971 Dodge Coronet. 
I believe well, maybe musical, 1970. that's a good idea. That's yeah, Coronet. Sense. Oh, okay, sorry, go right. ahead. <laughs> With a, a very hideous Because before the, drum, the trumpets really took off, still yes. a lot of folks using coronets. Right, the Marine like Band still uses coronets, okay. actually. Right. Fair enough. Go ahead. But, uh, yes, it was, but it was very functional, and sure. it got me through college. What color? Gold-ish. <laughs> Very I think nice. I think if you would have I think in the manual somewhere it said that it was gold. Sure. I'm not sure that was actually the color. <laughs> so now I have a former student of yours who's told me that you're very fond of the movie The Comedian with Jerry Seinfeld. Yes, yes, that is a great movie. It's a fantastic movie. And yeah. they, you make all of your. I show it in my seminar, it and it's not it's not just to kill a little time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not like, okay, nothing else to do. Today's Sound of Music. You know, it's not like <laughs> right, that. Right. That movie is great. And anyone who's going to be successful at anything can gain something by watching that movie. But especially, I think, musicians or anyone who's an artist. Why? Well, first of all, it's back to hard work and it's about preparation and the fact that there's this poor guy. You have, you, you know, you've been embarrassed for people before. You're just mortified you know, watching this other guy who's in the movie who sort of resents Jerry Seinfeld and all of his success and talks about how, you know, well, it's just Jerry Seinfeld and he got lucky with the TV show and that's the only reason that he's getting, you know, all this attention. But the fact is that Seinfeld is out there busting his hump, working, putting all new material together, you know, to and going back to basics, appearing in all of these comedy clubs, sort of rebuilding his act, rebuilding his career after the end of the run of the very successful, the most successful at that time, television show that there time. had ever been, yep. right? And he didn't, he certainly didn't have to be doing that, but he's out there working harder than everyone else. And there's also several really interesting interviews with just vignettes of people, you know, Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld talking, uh, scenes like that that probably led to the whole comedians in cars, you know, would cause. I was just going to say the only thing that would have made that better is if, like, picture Seinfeld here. Chris Rock here playing with like the, the, the doors and everything in right. a mini van. So I'm glad I got to it before. Yeah. Well, have you ever seen the the preview, like the trailer, for the movie? I'm sure I have. I don't recall it right offhand. The trailer is one of the best parts. Oh really? really yes. I was okay. talking. I should check it out. Well, we should. It's Would, on the DVD, I'm sure. So yes. I'll have to look at it. Would you like time. to see it? Sure. Okay. Well, let's let's hop into the back here. And okay. We can watch it on the screen. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Actually, fire, right? Fire. I will always show this from now. I've never shown this in part of our well, seminar. See, you're, you're but that's, missing out. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I'm so glad I did this today. Well, this has been worth it. Nothing else has been, but this has been. Well, yeah, this has been great. I, I completely understand. Mm -hmm.